hormones are there to do one thing. Hormones are there specifically to cause a behavior. Girl, you've got questions. Questions about your body and how to feel good in it, about your hormones and how to keep them in check. Questions about your sex life and your whole health. Can you imagine having a best girlfriend who was also a triple board certified OBGYN? A girlfriend doctor you could call and ask or tell her anything. Someone who could show you how to live any stage of life before, during, or after menopause in a big, bold, and beautiful way. Well, friends, I'm your girlfriend doctor. I believe you are meant to flourish and shine, to embrace life and awaken to all its possibilities. Let's get there together. Welcome to our show. Welcome everyone to the Girlfriend Doctor Show. I'm Dr. Anna Kaveka, and I am thrilled to be here with you today. Are you ready for an upgrade? Have you thought, okay, my life needs an upgrade. I want to upgrade my body, upgrade my hair, just sign me up for an overhaul upgrade. Well, I am focused on that word because a researcher, scientist, author that I admire so much has written a book called The Upgrade. And I'm going to interview her today, and I'm so excited about it. It is uh, Luann Brizendine. I want to make sure I pronounce that correctly. Luann, Dr. Luann Brizendine. And she, she has written this book, and I've gotten a pre-release copy, and I'm really excited about it because there's so many fascinating things that we can talk about when it comes to our health and our brain and mental health. There's a physiology to mental health, and it's long been ignored. So many, so many patients of mine will come in, have come in and said, you know, Dr. Anna, I just feel depressed. I feel lonely. I feel isolated. I'm fine with staying home and never going out again. I'm fine with never having sex again. I'm fine with, you know, just that this, but inside we know like, I'm not fine with it. I want more for my life. I am not done living. It over the hill should be a time of freedom. You know, it says when you're 50, you're over the hill, all those buddy birthday balloons. Well, over the hill, just think of riding a bike downhill. I mean, easy, exhilarating, free flowing. I mean, just a tremendous feeling to be over the hill. And that's what I want to to be for, I, I want it to be that way for me. I want it to be that way for you. So there are changes as you know, that happen to our brain as we age. And there, it's a multifaceted approach to heal our, our mind, our body, and spirit. It's all together. When I was a college student, I was a double major, biology and psychology, and a minor in French. I was working on all these things. Plus, I was putting myself through college. And so I was working in research in the psychology department. I was waiting tables and waitressing. And I was in, in I went to Ursinus College and King of Prussia area had many good restaurants. So there was um, the Lily Lang Trees Dinner Theater. And I used to carry these big trays up on one arm and wear these, you know, high heels, like about an inch and a half, pretty high heel for waiting tables and carry these trays. And I was working a lot. And the psychology professor uh, one of them came to me and said, you know, Anna, you are burning yourself out. You're, you're doing so much. And this double major, he said, just Dr. Rideout said to me, gosh, when was this? 1983. He said, Anna, you just have to choose, choose biology or psychology. And he knew I absolutely loved both. And I, I looked at him after he said that and I thought about it and I said, how do you separate the two? How do you separate the two? I needed both. And needless to say, I finished with a double major in biology and psychology in, in, my, in my four years. And I kind of think about that and, and say, wow, I did, do, I did do a lot at one time. But really, you know, how do you celebrate? How do you separate the two? We need to celebrate each, each one, each part and the intertwining of it. Like they can't separate it. And I know that now they're 40, what is it? 40 almost... <laughs> Uh, some many years later, 35 years later, I know that now more than ever, you cannot separate biology from psychology. So with that said, I want you to think about in your life, 
what affects your mental health the most? What are some things in your life that do affect your mental health the most? Is it physical? Is it, is it thoughts? Is it a person? What affects your sense of peace? In the Bible, it says we are uh, deserve the peace that there is the peace that surpasses all understanding. And I want that for each of you. The, the discovery of how to get there has, has been a journey for me. And it really does come to honoring our physiology. For me and my community, the Keto Green Way, it's more than just what we eat, right? It's a lifestyle. It's positive thoughts. It's oxytocin. It's creativity. It's fun. It's community. And that is, has the biggest impact on our mental health. So with that said, I want to introduce my guest, my very esteemed, amazing guest with you today, Dr. Luann Brizendine. And she completed her degree in neurobiology at UC Berkeley. She graduated from Yale School of Medicine and did her internship and residency at Harvard Medical School. She also served on both the faculties of Harvard University and University of California at San Francisco. She founded the Women's Mood and Hormones Clinic at UCSF and her New York Times bestseller, The Female Brain, and its follow-up, The Male Brain, continued to be read around the world. Her new book, The Upgrade, How the Female Brain Gets Stronger and Better in Midlife and Beyond, is to be released April 19th, 2022. And um, she is now esteemed as the Lynn and Mark Bina Endowed Professor of Clinical Psychiatry at UCSF. Dr. Brizendine continues to speak, write, research, and consult, and be interviewed on podcasts such as mine. I'm so glad to have her. So her book comes out just a, just a week after my book. So grab Menu Pause, my new book, Menu Pause, and grab Dr. Brizendine's book, The Upgrade. All right, let's, let me introduce you to her now. Well, welcome, Dr. Brizendine. It is great to be here with you. Oh, thanks there. Great to have us together finally. And we just have so much in common and it's just like so much fun to get a girlfriend chat here like real time, <laughs> honey. It's just like, so thank you for being kind enough to like reach out to me. Oh my gosh, my pleasure, my honor. And I'm, I'm excited because like serious, like a huge celebrity. I mean, amazing author, amazing scientist, amazing physician, but also it's like a, a movie star too, right? Because your book, The Female Brain became a movie. So I want to talk about that first. I love that movie. Did you like that movie? It was really, it was, I, I don't know. Did you find it was funny too? It was supposed to be funny. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. I found it funny, sarcastic, witty. And there's that. And Beanie Feldstein, Beanie Feldstein in it is, you know, she's got a major part in it. Don't you just love her? Oh my God. Love her. Now who played you? So um, Whitney Cummings played me. I always, I always wanted to be like tall, thin, you know, like, like, like she tall, thin and elegant like she is. So, and she's so funny. And anyway, she plays, she plays a very, uh, shall we say, um, a, a very like um, stiff version of me, like, you know, kind of like the, the ice queen uh, scientist <laughs> version of me, which I thought was really funny. So it's funny to watch somebody play you. Uh, on, on, I think she did a fabulous job. Oh, it was a great movie. Okay, so give me a little behind the scenes on that. Did she hang out with you for a week or so beforehand? How oh, did she so get it's very you? funny. So she, um, of course, they, they when they want to option your book and stuff, you know, the whole process, they email you and they kind of, they talk me, whatever they go, you go through all those nine yards. And then, then she came up to have lunch with me just one-on-one -on -one at, at my house. Just the two of us were home. Nobody else was home. And so it's really funny because she goes into my office and then she goes into my, to my library and she looks at all my books. She's like kind of, she, and she talks with me. She kind of almost like memorizes me and all my little quirks, you know, <laughs> My gosh, I um, love that. Okay, so you have a lot. Like, so tell me about your library. Like, I can see you. Like, my imagination, of course, from seeing the female brain too. Is your office? Is your library like that? Yeah, yeah. It's got it's got all kinds of. Well, you know, it's got endocrinology books and neuroscience books. You know, it's got the you know the 
you know, all, all of the, 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 the five volume set that uh, Don Pfaff did years ago on, on behavior and hormones, you know, it's got all of that stuff in it. And then all the stuff I read over the years, like, you know, Carol Gilligan's book in a different voice, you know, all the things that all the books that I love and Natalie Andrews book, you know, a woman, you know, I just, you know, it has all that stuff in it. So she just kind of took it all in and, I have a beautiful um, window that overlooks the bay here in Sausalito, which is my office. So that's where I wrote Female Brain. And it's so it's just, uh, anyway, so she just kind of came and like took it all in. <laughs> oh, wow. That is, that is great. That's so and cool. Then what she wrote experience? the screenplay. So she, she wrote it. And stuff. Yeah, she just, she loved the book so much. It became her Bible. And, and, you know, I had a few people I had like Jane Fonda came to my office when she was writing a book and she has, you know how some people have the green magic mark, green and blue and the highlighted in yellow, but she had all different colors and all different little stickies on the, on the, in the margins and things written in the margins. I sat there and thought like, wow, Jane Fonda must have been like an amazing student, you know, because she's just got all this. So she was like, you know, uh, just the, taking notes and, and uh, memorizing that book. So it's been fun to watch people do that. And Whitney Cummings did the same. And then I was down on the set uh, um, and also in the editing room a few times just to be, I wanted to be available to them. So that was kind of cool to get to go down to Hollywood and go into the editing room and see all the things they were trying to, you know, because it's a, it's a, it's a very well-crafted, you know, movie in terms of how they did the how they put things together and the different because they did scenarios out of the book so they did like couple scenarios and, and, and little tips that different couples were having and how they were solving them and how it related to how females think about things and males think about things so I, I thought they did a Anyway, it's a, it's a, oh, they did such a good job. I love that movie. I'm going to have to go watch it again. The female brain. I'm going to go watch it again. And yeah, just me now, too. I haven't seen it in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, it, maybe you think the upgrade will become a movie too. We'll have to see. No, it could. The upgrade is so, so what I did with the upgrades and I didn't ever think I'd do, of course, another one, but you know, as you, as you go along and get older yourself and you see, Oh, but you know, I really want to talk about this part of you know the, the next stage of life and the next developmental stage and because you know being in psychiatry i i think a lot in developmental stages and chunks and so the female brain takes you up to the um kind of the beginning of the transition and um so chapter seven in that one is called the mature female brain so it's basically that so the next the next one is like dissecting things that happen to you between like age let's say early forties, you know, 42 to 45 in chunks in a way up to, you know, the age of 80 or 90. And so um, I didn't divide it in terms of years or anything, but it's, uh, it kind of follows along kind of developmental chunks of our, of our lives. And there's so much that happens in that time. That's, Oh my God. And it's, it's also just, I don't know. It's really, I think it should be hopeful to younger women because so many cool things that happen and so many changes that happen that if you know it, if you embrace them and know what it's doing to you, I mean, you're in for a much happier bunch of decades than you, than you had in the past. <laughs> right. Your second half, we say breeze through menopause into the second spring of your life. And so we Absolutely. really want to be able to appreciate it, remember it, thrive in it, ha laugh through it. So let's talk about that because as your brain, like as we change, as we tradition transition, and I've talked a lot too about with my audience about the declining progesterone from mid thirties, DHEA declines estrogen testosterone gradual declines and these affect our brain affect our thoughts our you know our our physiology affects our behavior our mood our memory and and I want to hear about what you're, I mean, you're on the cutting edge of science and discovery regarding this because there's so many psychoses that develop, depression that develops, uh, I always say bipolar or hormonal. <laughs> and so, you know, hormonal changes that create mood changes. And often we think, and the traditional psychiatry would 
be more, you know, addressing medication versus hormones and lifestyle. And so looking, and also now we can image the brain and, and get more insight into what's happening. Please, Luann, share with us this, this trans, the transition that the brain is going through because it's a rewiring as important as puberty is on our brain. Absolutely. Menopause it's- is rewiring it's so important it's it is it is like a kind of a re a reworking of the circuits basically and i think that first before we start this something really one major principle that everybody needs to remember in biology and that is that hormones are there to do one thing hormones are there specifically to cause a behavior so there's hormones that cause us to be thirsty there's hormones that cause us to um want to eat there's hormones there that cause us to want to shut off wanting to eat. There's hormones that want us to have sex. You know, there's so all these behavioral things that we actually do are, are, are it's, it's sort of a strange thing because we, we think that we're in, we're, we think we're driving our own ship, which of course we are, but there's a whole lot of push that hormones give us. And so in the probably late thirties, now right about 37, 38, 39 years old as our, as our little follicles start to just stop producing as much, you know, estrogen and testosterone and progesterone, there's, there's some shifts. And remember, as those hormones from the follicles go down, the pituitary gets very agitated because it's the conductor of the symphony. And it feels like some of the instruments in that orchestra, i.e. your follicle, they're not playing loudly enough. So it starts to shout at the ovaries to play louder and it sends all kinds of hormonal signals to play louder. However, then all of a sudden the ovary will squirt out a huge amount of whatever it has left. And that sometimes is like double, triple, quadruple what we usually have. So actually sometimes in this early transition, we are having higher spikes of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone than we're used to having. So that can put you on edge in in a millisecond, like, boom, you can be on edge. You can be ready to bite somebody's head off, you know? Right, right. Nice one minute, nasty the next. You're like, that's not me. I don't want to behave this way. And so it's important to know that it's the, the hormones that are doing that because it's, it's like, it's not, it's definitely not you at your best. It's not who you really are. So that's important to keep in mind that it's a bit of a roller coaster of this like dialogue between the pituitary and the ovaries that they're having this, like this fight with each other that can go on. It can kind of intermittently go on for a few days of a cycle and then kind of quiet down for a month or two and then come back. And then of course, when you get into like the probably the 46 to 49 year old stage, usually, then the pituitary may be screaming a lot at the ovary, but the follicles are really sort of, they're they're done. They're done. They have, the ovary has retired. It (laughs) has done a good job. Thank you for your service. Done a good job. And thank you for your service. It's retired. So it's not going to be having so much of that dialogue, but all through that, just remember their little chunks of days where it's a roller coaster and then you may be fine for a while but just to honor the fact that okay it's like a thing like just you you need to honor and nurture yourself on those days realizing that's not you you've not all of a sudden become a a screaming banshee (laughs) you know try and tell that to your kids but anyway you know you know it's a it's something to 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 um, realize and so I take people through a lot of that in the book um, particularly in chapters three and four about that kind of roller coaster and, and different aspects of it. And I kind of tell it through people's stories. So um, I tell different stories of different ones of my patients. Um, and of course, um, they, they, they've changed their name, so there's no, no breach of confidentiality, but I've uh, told a lot of various people's stories as they go through that period and sort of how they, how they come out of it and how they handle it. And you know, one thing that's really interesting uh, as a physician noticing when women are younger, say in their late thirties, early forties, and they have a hysterectomy, their ovary, if their ovaries are removed, they have that drastic surgical menopause symptoms, right? And we're going to work on that with hormones and balance that out. But yet, even without their ovaries in place, come fifties, there to mid fifties, there's another, it's almost like a secondary menopause, another hormonal 
rewiring that's happening. And so I really always was curious, what other hormones are involved? What else is affecting the neurotransmitters at that stage? Or is it just, this is a stressful stage of life, but it seems to be, you know, uh, very um, common occurrence in, in women who have had a hysterectomy or, or their ovaries removed, that there's the second about having, stage. Yeah. Yeah, the second. So basically having your, your ovaries and your uterus out, which is called, we call it a total hysterectomy at whatever stage that is. And usually now the, the um, people, uh, doctors usually, if you have a total hysterectomy, will then put like an estrogen patch on you or something. They don't just let you like fall off the cliff like they did in the old days. I remember right. in the old days, oh, basically, yeah. they just didn't do anything. And women's brains literally sometimes just seized up and you just ended up in a pool of sweat all the time. They don't do, they don't, this, they know that now. So in the recovery room after your, after your hysterectomy, they will put a patch on you. So I, I had one and they put a patch on me right away. It was good. One of my, one of my girlfriends, my OBGYN girlfriends made sure of that. So yes, at any rate, I, I was, I was grateful for that. Still, I'm grateful for that. That's, so it, that's we so don't, important. Like, yeah. yeah, they won't, they won't let you, they won't let you, they won't let you fall, fall through the cracks after that. Or, you know, if any, if for some reason they've forgotten to do that for you, you got to be on top of them and say, uh, did you put the patch on me in the recovery room, et cetera. So yeah. that's really nice. They don't let you do that. But I think what you're talking about is something a little different that happens maybe in your early fifties sometimes is that um, even if you've had a total hysterectomy and there may be, um, let's say you're usually um, these days, people, once you've been put on the patch, remember, if you do not have a uterus, you do not need to take progesterone in general. I mean, some people will give a little bit of progesterone back for other reasons, but like for sleep and, and things like that. But you don't technically need any progesterone if you've had your, your uterus out. Well, um, I, I, you know, I talk yeah. about this a lot here because, you know, I will say you need progesterone with or without a uterus, but bioidentical progesterone, not progestins, the negative yes. side effect of synthetic progestins. Right. So a lot of my topical. patients like to take the natural progesterone at bedtime, which yes. really helps them with sleep Yes, and it helps uh, balance out some of the um, you know, the, it depends on how, how high the estrogen is, but so it's, it's, it's very individual, but I'm just saying like, there's no, there's no medical, um, there's no medical danger in not taking, you know, progesterone if you have, you know, if you don't have your uterus. So I, so I, so I kind of set it up that way so that you're, so let's say that you've got, you're taking your estrogen patch, blah, blah, blah. You've got everything else has been okay for a while. And then in your fifties, all of a sudden, some, you know, you start to like, you kind of lose steam, lose a little bit of your energy. You kind of, there's a whole lot of, and, and a lot of women start to feel um, uh, a little bit crabby and fatigued and meant, it's sort of uh, cognitively not as sharp at that stage. And I think one area of research that it, the adrenal glands, so let's talk about the adrenal glands. Yes, I love and, the and adrenal glands. The, oh, the adrenal glands are very important as we all know. And one of the things that when we're, when we're in our younger years, 20s and 30s, our, our ovaries make about 90% of our testosterone and the adrenals make about 10% when we're younger. But let's say you take out the ovaries and you know, whatever, you don't have those guys anymore. And then all, so all of your, all of your testosterone is going to be made by your adrenal glands by and large. So we really do count a lot on those old adrenal glands for a lot of stuff. Remember, it makes the stress hormone, but it also makes D, this the androgen we call DHEA, which in the body then gets converted into testosterone. And it's very important um, uh, to have our testosterone because our libido will be totally in the toilet, <laughs> our, you know, we, and our energy level and um, et cetera. So DHEA that comes from your adrenal, the testosterone that comes from your adrenal becomes very important. But as we get older, guess what happens? All kinds of cells in our body, all kinds of cells start to go um, to a place where they don't make as much of what they used to make, including the adrenal. So we start making less and less of our testosterone, even from our adrenal glands. So the, I get a lot of women coming to the office at that stage, and I'm sure you do too, which is like, they've got, let's say you've got a husband and you're both, let's say, let's say you're roughly the same age, so you're both like 52. 
And um, remember, men don't go through andropause usually until, you know, they hit around 60. So, you know, they start to go through some changes of their own where they're losing some of their testosterone. But let's say you're both 52 and he has, you know, he still has not the screaming libido he used to have at 29, but, you know, he still has enough that, that he's like, he's pretty interested at least a few times a week. And you are like, get that thing away from me. <laughs> you know, uh, it's like, yeah, it's and like, okay, that's the last thing on my to-do list. Thank you're you. Going like, yeah. I just need sleep. Please take that thing away. Anyway. So if you're like, if you get like that, I get, that's when women come to my office, they go, God, Dr. Brisson, you got to save my marriage. If I never had to see that thing again, it would be okay. But I just don't want my relationship to go sell. You know, I, so at that point is when we start discussing, um, sort of supplementing a little bit with either DHEA or testosterone or, or some kind of combination that will work for that individual woman. And I just want women out there that are listening um, to this podcast to know, and I'm sure you've told them many times that, um, you know, you just really do need to talk with your doctor about this because there are things that can be done. And, um, you know, in Europe, actually, in other, in other countries, there's all kinds of compounds that are used, like they have the testosterone pump in Europe, they have all kinds of things that are not, for some reason, have never gotten through the FDA here. Don't get me started on that, because they basically, right. during, and, during the, the Bush administration, they canceled the women's health division of the FDA. Oh, that is that, just infuriating. That uh, was looking into low libido in women and what could be done. They felt like it's kind of like, oh, no orgasm or libido for a woman is ho-hum, whatever. And if it's in a man, it's like a 911 to the ER, no libido, no orgasm for him. You know, So we're, we're still dealing with a lot of sexism in the medical system. Yeah, we are. And it's very frustrating. And I would say, you know, having prescribed testosterone for sexual health, first of all, it's off-label, right? As physicians, we have the liberty to do off-label prescribing based on our best judgment, our clinical you know, experience and, and recommendations for our patients off-label prescribing. I'm just going to say that again. That is that is how we've been trained. That's the art of medicine. So with the FDA I means studies to go through the FDA for each indication is how it gets FDA approval. So from prescribing Lipitor, for example, for off-label use or prescribing metformin for PCOS, off-label use. I mean, it's it goes on and on and on. So testosterone is one of those reasons. And also, and, D, and DHEA is over the counter. My audience knows it's in my Jolva, my Jolva In the product. United States. In, in the United States, States it's, it's over, the, over counter. the counter. In Europe, it's yes. not. In it's Europe, prescription. it's not. <laughs> it, yeah, in, in most, and in Canada, for instance, mm -hmm. it's only prescription too. So the, the, that is so true. And and it's a conundrum for sure, but DHA has tremendous amount of safety profiles. Now what's happening, like when we're doing this, we ought, and this is one of the things, Luann, I lecture on sexual health and I've done so over, around the world. So listening to other, uh, you know, physicians or hormone specialist practices in, in hormone therapy. And so it's really fascinating me. And one of the things I recognize from my own practice and, you know, consulting in some very large hormone clinics was that, you know, training physicians like our, our hormones affect our physiology. So if you give someone, man or woman, too much testosterone, that will create maybe agitation, anger amongst the other great feelings, right? You can get over the top, but it also may create, it will create novelty seeking behavior, which could lead to affairs and a divorce situation. So we want to re recognize how hormones do, like you said, uh, you, you said right off the beginning, hormones are for, for um, creating behavior, cause of behavior. And so when we supplement with that too, I think that's just so profound. Your gynecologist is an expert on your hormones, right? So have they told you which foods can affect your hormone balance? Well, if you're like most women, the answer is no. To be honest, there's often not time in a doctor's visit to go beyond the basics. And I should know, I'm a gynecologist, but food is medicine and our nutritional requirements change at certain times of the month and certainly as we age. Most of us trade tips with our sisters, friends, colleagues, but the truth is what works for them may not work for you. 
I'm Dr. Anna Quebec. I'm a triple board certified OBGYN and author of the best-selling books, The Hormone Fix and Keto Green 16. I've helped millions of women feel better, feel more energized, and balance their hormones naturally. If you'd like to know which diet is right for you at this stage of your life, take my menu pause quiz to find out. So I'll tell you a little story about, I remember when I first got into this and I remember it's like, this is whatever, this has been an area that's been uh, of interest to me. And lots of patients have come to see me over the last 25 years on this, on the libido issue. And I remember this one school teacher, she came to me and she was in her late forties and, you know, her husband still was wanting to, you know, and anyway, he had a strong libido and she didn't all of a sudden have any. And so we decided and those were the days when the only way you could get to t- t- testosterone was to give it in, prescribe it kind of in a male version and tell the woman to take a lower dose of the male version. So at any rate, of course, the pharmacy made a mistake in what they told her and she went home and she was taking 10 times what I had told her to take for about uh, several weeks up to a month. And um, she came back and she says, Dr. Presendine, I just got to tell you, you know, I, 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 I really like this stuff, but I, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you, but I, I, in between classes at school, I would have to go into the bathroom and kind of um, relieve myself. <laughs> in a different meaning right self-pleasure like, take, so my, take my sex take my sex toys to work with me but she said I felt I felt she says I felt like a 19 year old boy I was like you know she says some That's of us hysterical. kind of good, but she says she says I was how, just, guy, how do guys manage <laughs> right yeah. I know she says she said she says oh my god she says I can't believe it. I just like those poor guys. That's all they must think of. That's all I was thinking. All I was thinking about was going into the bathroom and masturbating. That is so funny. So that that is such a, a huge issue. How do you approach a couple like that with a, um, you know, that uh, that distant the. In, in with your special like how how do you treat them when there's a decrease in libido and um, she's really struggling. And she's, you know, worked through, they've got a good relationship because of course that's key. I always say there are many spokes on the wheel. I have a program called Sexual CPR. Very holistic, yes. right? Very holistic. Yes. But there are many, like, is it medical? Is there a medication over-the-counter drug that you're taking that's affecting you? Is it um, relational? Is it environmental? Are you super stressed? Of course, you're not going to want to have sex. What's your, you know, what's what's the home environment? And also, you know, what are, how, you know, what's your past history? What's the psychology of your um, sexuality? So I'm curious to have. Absolutely. Well, you have the couple. And so, you know, if the couple has a good relationship, then um, I think that, that those of us who aren't certified sex therapists, right, we can manage that because some of it we can do through education. And we say, okay, we're going to test drive this um, DHEA formula for her. We're going to test drive this testosterone formula for her. And, um, we want you guys to, you know, kind of like basically keep a little flow chart for the next month and come back and see me again at the end of the month. And let's, let's dissect it and see what worked and what didn't work and how we're going to have to tweak it. So if the couple has a good relationship and they can do that, especially guys, the guys love to do spreadsheets, you know, they, whatever they, especially when it comes to sex. I mean, they are, they are on it, man. They are, they're probably, they're going to drive her crazy about with their spreadsheet, but anyway, anyway. <laughs> that's so funny. Yep. They're They'll very task back, oriented. They're very good. They're very task oriented. All you gotta do is tell them what to do. And they're very task oriented. So as you make them, if you give him a task, give them a task and they have a good enough relationship where she's not feeling like, kind of like she's, she's on display and kind of like, she's always, you know, so they had to work it around out so that they usually it's great to schedule the time of sex for couples. If they have kids, especially like, you know, put the, the kids maybe having a cartoon, something they like to do on Saturday morning, that may be a great time for sex, but just, you know, find a couple times during the week when they kind of have a scheduled thing. So that takes the burden off the woman to not feel like she's always on call for sex. And it takes the guys expect it makes the guys expectations very specific, and they're very good at having that specific thing. So you have to kind of organize it in a way that will work for that couple. So let's say you try that for a couple of months, 
and you diddle around with the dosage that she's getting and whatever that may that may very well work for that that couple in about you know maybe about half the time if it doesn't work what i tend to do is i have some really great sex therapists that are very well trained and very experienced that then i will often send the couple to the sex therapist along with already having her hormones fixed so that's the the other you know it doesn't work in a few months with what i know to do um, I, I usually realize that, okay, there's some other aspects there that are outside of my wheelhouse that I do know my, my other part of the team that are sex therapists really do know, do know how to do. So anyway, that's kind of my approach. I don't know what you think about that, but it just, it's really, you know, it, it, it's a way to approach it. And most doctors are not trained at all to do this. Most, oh, most gynecologists. I mean, I have some of my best girlfriends are OBGYNs, but honestly, they feel like this is Pandora's box. And if they ask a question about it while you're up in the stirrups and they've got their, you know, your speculum in and you're doing your, you know, pap smear, whatever, if they bring up the issue of libido or sex or whatever, they don't even want to talk to you about it because they don't have time anymore to, to even deal with it. So um, sad story about that, but that is, that's, that's where they're, they're at. They'll, instead of that, they'll say, oh, why don't you go over to Dr. Brizendine's clinic and talk to her? You know, they would rather I, give them yeah. a referral to get them out the door quickly. Well, it's so true. I mean, it's a different type of practice. And, you know, as a OBGYN, one of the reasons I created the sexual CPR program, it's because by the time you know, you're finished the exam, you've talked to them, your hands on the door to leave. And they're like, and Dr. Anna, I really don't have any sex drive. I'm like, okay, that's a, that, I mean, that's a two to three hour conversation there because yes. there are many aspects that I, you know, I, um, I, I trained at Emory, but I was a National Health Service Corps scholar. So my practice, my um, rural, I had a rural practice in McIntosh County, Georgia, which is Darien, a shrimping village. I was the only specialist ever there, let alone woman physician, bilingual. And um, and so like there's no, and, and, and then I had an office also in Brunswick, Georgia, but there are no sex therapists, right? So how do I help? Like, soup to nuts, what right? even Help. is a sex therapist i mean it's yeah. to, to that population they think it sounds like you're from outer space Yep. Yeah, exactly. And then you think, okay, well, what can I do to help? And that's where I just like, okay, well, it's, it's just me here, right? Solo practice. It's just me. I got to figure it out. So I totally get that. And that, that is um, the, you know, the, it, it's, there's, there's, a constellation of issues. And I want to focus on that more because as the female brain ages, and I want to talk about this book, your book, The Upgrade, because in your chapter seven, which I just was immediately drawn to, it's your brain in search of connection. And my audience knows, like, I'm going to start talking about oxytocin and love and connection, but the most powerful hormone in our body. And you talk about, you have this, um, where the experience of working with patients that say, I could die of loneliness. And, um, and that is more prevalent now. I mean, I hear it and, um, I want you to, I, I would love for you to address this because I think community, you know, with unity, community connection per, to ourselves, right. To be at home in our own body and mind and spirit and to others is the greatest, you know, gift of living. I think that this is, of course, it's another pandemic. It's another epidemic is loneliness. And because it's been pandemic, it's also, you know, that's exacerbated uh, people's, people's loneliness. And I think especially if you think about that concept in terms of life stages for women, it's, we're talking about the stages after the kids start to leave home. We're talking about the empty nest. We're talking about maybe, um, maybe the couple's relationship, the marriage is like whatever, whatever stresses and strains were in it before are going to be like, um, you know, they may, they, those threads, those threads may not hold together too well during this time. And so all of a sudden the woman is like, it's like all of a sudden she's just kind of left out in the cold. And in America, you know, we really do uh, in, I mean, in, in a lot of communities, people have moved across the country for jobs. They've moved everywhere for this. You know, people people don't live in a little commune with the rest of their extended family anymore, for by, by and large. And I think that people don't. It's like the basic human wiring 
you get back to this hormone called oxytocin, they call it the love hormone, but it's also the touch hormone. And it's also the cuddle hormone. If someone gives you like a 20 second hug, this is all the research, you know, is showing if someone gives you a 20 second, you know, sincere hug, it releases oxytocin in your body. And, you know, if someone kind of like also pats you on the head or gives you a squeeze, like all of these things, all the things we haven't been able to do during the pandemic, like the six foot distance thing is like, I mean, to the body and to the wiring of the human being, this is frigging torture. That's why the virus, that's it's why the virus is the viruses love us so much because the viruses love us so much because we're an up we're up close personal we kiss and we hug and we're whatever and that's how we give viruses to each other too the viruses have have basically exploited something that's very human about us so just it's like it's i'm so this is horrible but it's like that's the truth so true. where we're finding ourselves and so finding ways to um you know, I think a lot of people have had more chance during this period to get in touch with their spiritual life too, um, as, as, as um, an antidote to loneliness. It depends on what you have as, as your spiritual practice. Or, you know, there's just like the, so I think, first of all, there's a thing called, you know, the, the three A's, you know, first you have to, first you have to become aware of something. You have to become aware that you're lonely. And then you, the next step is the other A is like, then you have to accept, accept that you're lonely and that acceptance of that. And to know that that is, that that is a debilitating state to you. And that's why you're feeling so badly. And it's, it, it's affecting you physically too. Sometimes people get GI problems because of this, or they won't eat enough, or they don't like move enough. So they don't, you know, they get either get constipated. I mean, all kinds of physical symptoms start to occur for people who are lonely that you wouldn't think should be related to loneliness, but they really are. I mean, how could constipation be related to loneliness? Well, you're not drinking as much as you should. You're not moving around as much. You know, you know, you're not eating. It's like all kinds of reasons, and you're not eating with other people. Well, it's also you have to think like the macrocosm to the microcosm, right? So like, as we are people, our gut, like our bacteria, you have to wonder, they're lonely too. Like if we're lonely, aren't they going to be lonely? I don't know. I'm just creating yeah. another cartoon video. Yeah. Another, another dimension to this is yeah. really important. I mean, like that's the microbiome, the microbiome we have is because we've gotten that from other people for the most part, you know? And so, you know, all of these aspects of both our health or well-being. And, you know, so the three mental, A's, mental health, aware, so, accept, and, and then the third is action. Action. Okay. So once A you become aware two, <laughs> of something, once you become, you're counting too, <laughs> once you become aware of something, then you get to this phase where you, if you accept it, you just have to work, you work on accepting it. And once you've hit the place of acceptance, then the action plan starts, right? Then your action plan says, you first of all have to have some compassion for yourself that you're that that you're that you are feeling lonely, that you are feeling that you don't have enough social context. And especially, you know, there was this great study about girlfriends and the number of contacts you need with girlfriends per week, like runs at, at least minimum of four. So ah. you need at least at least four contacts with girlfriends. Okay. Every day. Okay, well, that could be a face and that could be a call, that can be whatever. I don't or it can be a walk with them. I'm during COVID, I know that you know I've I, mostly it's like I, I contact girlfriends by phone or sometimes we text or we, you know, somehow, you know, a bunch of us do a zoom call on Saturday. My girlfriends that we used to meet up for Saturday lunch. Now we meet up for Saturday zoom. If it's a, like a really bad outbreak, like right now, you know, it, we just try to keep contact. And so um, it's often not enough, but it's, it's a way that you have also the acknowledgement and the, that you have that piece of knowledge that human beings need contact with other human beings and there's nothing wrong with you. It's not like you're not like you're a baby or not like you're weak or not like there's something wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. You need contact with other people. Humans are wired that way. And when we don't have contact with others, there's a part of us that starts to shut down and feel like um, we're going to be left out on the ice floe to die. It's a very weird biological thing that starts to happen, but kind of like the, a death spiral thing starts to happen in your body and in your head. And, you know, that's, people don't realize that it's actually loneliness is, loneliness is as deadly, they say now, as smoking. 
I believe it. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And it's, uh, you know, it's so, there's so much, gosh, I know I could talk to you forever. I want to honor your time and, and have you just like summarize, you know, just uh, you know, that the concept of the aging female brain. One thing I talk to my audience a lot about, and I write about it in my book, The Hormone Fix, is that cortisol oxytocin connection disconnection. So when, when cortisol is winning, it's that isolation. When we're adding in those doses, that self-medication of oxytocin, the laughter, the friendship, and, and you guys, four girlfriend touches a week, four girlfriend touches a week. I love that. I love that really to say, okay, did I reach out to A, B, C, D, right? And it's being that person for someone else. I, I think that's definitely, I boot that as a, as a, as a, uh, uh, going to put that on a sticky around my house just to remember, make sure that I'm doing that. Did I do four, right? Check that off. And so that, that's a really powerful, a powerful, uh, way to heal from that isolation. So as a woman's brain is aging, 37 to 39, we've got our hormones going on, 46 to 49, there's that other, you know, there's that more of that rewiring, testosterone, DHEA, that declines pretty predominant, but yet we have a, a, a shift in the testosterone to estrogen ratio. So we always talk about the, the ability, like the um, uh, not tolerating the the bullshit anymore type of hormonal profile. And then what happens? Then, then you get to get into your, you get into the last, the fifties and sixties actually are wonderful, wonderful decades because all of the studies show that we get happier each decade. And so, you know, think of your, by your seventies, you're going to be even happier that, and a lot of that comes with like, I think wisdom and letting go of the bullshit. There's <laughs> not, you just like, you know, the thing is, you know, also that you say, I know, I just want to eat a healthy diet and have a healthy amount of exercise. And I don't have to look like a perfect, some kind of image that I thought of myself at age 25, you let go of these, of these horrible things that we women do to ourselves of like having to live up to what weight or what size or what, whatever it was at that. So you've, you're letting go of a lot of that and you're doing the things that are much more meaningful to you in your fifties and sixties, the things that you care about and giving back to your community. A lot of women want to start doing something that's a, a bit of some kind of either, either volunteering or giving back or doing something to parts of their community that is um, engaging at a different level once they've had the empty nest um, experience. So there's there's all of this. And also that, you know, the husbands aren't being as demanding as they used to be, you know, as they, they're going through andropause at this stage too. So, you know, there's a lot of like, you know, ha having, you know, you're having a little bit of compassion for them, a lot, lot more compassion. I think it's the. I would say the word, the word for your fifties and sixties is more compassion for yourself nice. and for others. I love that. I love that compassion, community, connection. Yeah, it's all the beautiful. C's. We did a three A's. Now we're going to do the three, three C's, C's. Anna, and I did a three C's. Right, compassion, count. community, and connection. So. Um, what will people find in this book? And this book is available everywhere books are sold. I imagine it's going to be a New York Times bestseller. I really am praying that for you because this is such powerful information for everyone to read. You guys, her book is coming out April 19th, but you can pre-order it now. While you're doing that, make sure you've pre-ordered Menu Pause, which is coming out April 12th. We are like having back-to-back books here and they're very very complimentary so they are rock and roll i think it i think they should be a gift set of two don't you Anna? i do i think so i think so it'll be fun so um so yeah tell tell more about you know the um where they get the books where they find you and anything else you want to share and then i'm going to do my rapid series questions okay that's great you can definitely order it any place online that you can get it. Just, just, just Google the upgrade and Dr. Brizendine and you'll, you'll get the, the several links to it and you can get it from wh wherever, wherever the cheapest place you can get it. It's also in audio. It's also on Kindle. It's also, you know, it's in, it's in many, many forms. So at any rate that it'll be available in all of your bookstores. I try to support the local bookstores still to this day, the independent bookstores or bookstores, if you have a chance, just they are, they are a place that 
you know, they have employees, they have, a, you know, they, they just, you know, everybody knows where their favorite lo local bookstore is. So I say definitely support them. Absolutely. If you can go get it, if you can go get it there, that's great. If you're in the Bay Area, I, I do, I do lots of signings and things around here. So you can go get a signed copy and give it, you know, one of the nicest things about this is it's a great, it's a great gift for your gift for those four girlfriends of yours. So it's a good gift, you know, it's a good gift. And it's a good gift for Mother's Day too. Oh, it's perfect. All right. Thank you. Okay, you guys, the upgrade, Dr. Luann Brissendine. And all right, so here's my rapid fire questions, girlfriend. We're going to ask you some. So what is your favorite food? Oh, you know what I love? I mean, I love eating almond butter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was unexpected. That's great. Okay, what is your favorite drink or cocktail? You know, I have none. I do not drink. I have not had, I find that it makes me um, more about, kind of hot flashy, hot flashy, irritable and, and the sleep problem. I just decided it makes me feel so when I'm at people's homes, I'll let them maybe pour or whatever, but I just, I just go for the sparkling water these days. I've just, I gave it up. Okay. Do you have a favorite sparkling water? We're, we're big fans in this house of Topa Chico, but I did get my own sparkling water maker. We got our, my husband likes to make the, yeah, he goes definitely straight for the soda stream, whatever he does, he does it. Boom. And we have, that's what we have. I like that better. It's very fresh and it's very, it's just, just right. You know, it's in your own house. I love it. Okay. What's your favorite supplement to take? What supplement will you take on a daily basis? You know, um, I for sure take vitamin D on a daily basis. So that's, that's, that's kind of a real, real a powerful one. Me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I do, um, since some studies sh came out that showed that we do a lot better as we get older on, on a multivitamin every day. So, um, I don't really like them much. Some of the ways they make me feel, but I, I will, t I will definitely will take one of those. And then I have a little thing of called what called Pikmin's, do you know, Pikmin's, I think they're thorn makes them one of those make them. And I take vitamin K because I think it's really, uh, really, really useful for your bones. Absolutely. Especially I would say vitamin D says deposit calcium. Vitamin K says wear, take them together, not alone, right? That's right. What's your favorite exercise or so movement I activity? I am in the pool. I love the pool. Okay. I, do, I do swimming. And because we live in Marin County, the hiking trails are endless here. So being out on the beach and hiking up on the cliffs and stuff, you know, on these trails, amazing. Beautiful. Oh my gosh, I got a good visual of that. Okay, so when you have downtime, what do you like to do in your downtime? Um, I love meditating. And during COVID, especially, I've, I've developed more of a robust meditation practice. So I find um, that when I have some downtime, I like to meditate or I like to listen to some meditation, some Dharma lessons or some meditation tapes sometimes. You know, I like to listen to Tara Brock's Wednesday afternoon tapes or, you know, just different, different people that I like. I will like to listen to some, some podcasts, uh, some meditation podcasts. All right. This one, uh, what is your favorite sexual position? <laughs> well let's see um uh you know i think i think for you know depends on um depends on on who it's with but no <laughs> my husband <laughs> i'd still like the side by side oh so that's awesome very good yeah, I, I like the, i like the side by side i don't know why i developed that but that's the best it's been in recent years i mean like when i was younger it didn't matter everything worked everything worked in those days <laughs> but i i kind of like I, I like the side by side now oh that's good awesome all right uh, spooning is that like that you mean like spooning ah spooning and sex together <laughs> together yes, exactly right? good combination oh. all right so what is uh your favorite travel destination and where are you going next? Oh gosh, you can ask that in a pandemic. I am. <laughs> you know, I so I, I truly, I, you know, I I I I adore Barcelona. My favorite. I I don't know. There's just something about that town that just like, and you know, you know, I just I don't know. I love I love Spain. You know, that, and then there's lots of Italy that you know, being down on the Amalfi Coast and being you know, being in, being in, being in Rome or being, being in Venetia or being in actually Venice, Venice is up there too. Well, it's hard to, you know, it's been a, actually, and Istanbul is a beautiful city too. I really loved 
Istanbul. Ooh, I have be. yet to go to Istanbul. Oh, I can't wait. Yes, to that's go. on your list when when life when life calms down again and and COVID has gone back to bed. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I, that is fun. Thank you so much. Thanks for playing along with that, and um, thank you for being on the Girlfriend Doctor Show. I admire you. I admire your work and the heart you do it with. Thank you. Anna. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for having me on your show. And this is, listen, this counts as one of our girlfriend contacts for today. Okay. It absolutely. High does. five girlfriend. It absolutely high five. does. A girl, <laughs> girlfriend contact. Thank you for having me. <laughs> you are welcome. Thank you again for being here. You guys, Dr. Luann Brizendine, her book, The Upgrade, available everywhere books are sold. It is time to invest in yourself. There's always one next right step, an aha moment. And when you hear the science that supports it and the stories that surround the situations that you yourself or people you know that have dealt with and the solutions and why we're not crazy and we're not, you know, what our destiny is, is up to us. It's our choice in so many ways. So love the information here. And I want everyone to connect and share this great podcast, this great show, and share it if you watch it on YouTube or iTunes or wherever you're listening. Be sure to share and let me know what are your questions. Remember, there's no such thing as TMI. I look forward to your feedback. And till next time. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel here and get those notifications and comment below. Let me know your thoughts, what you loved and what your action step is.